So, Acts chapter 17 this morning. Appreciate each and every one of you being here this morning. You got it all zoomed well, Brian, the way it needed to be? Great. Should have known. 17 verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. When Paul got to Thessalonica, well, let's keep reading verse 2. So, where was a synagogue of the Jews? And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. So verse 2, when it says, As his manner was, went in unto them, where did he go in unto them? The synagogue from verse 1. Right? They came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. The synagogue of the Jews. And a key phrase right there, for the book of Acts, Paul, as his manner was. And we're going to see this every single place that Paul goes, every city where he goes. He goes into the synagogue during the book of Acts. That's going to change at the end of the book of Acts. But during the book of Acts, and remember the six books that Paul wrote during the book of Acts, right? First one he wrote was what? That became scripture. Galatians. The second, and so this isn't the order they appear, this is the order. So about Acts 16 or 17, he writes Galatians. Then, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Then, 1st Corinthians. Then, Romans. And then, 2nd Corinthians, um, Acts uh, 20. Okay, actually in Acts 20 is uh, the end of 19, he writes 1st Corinthians he writes Acts, then he writes Romans and 2 Corinthians pretty much right together at the beginning of uh, Acts uh, chapter 20. Okay, so it just puts it in perspective as we go through. All right, and of course all of this, Acts 20, is about 20 to 25 years after Paul is saved in Acts chapter 9. So again, just putting things in perspective, um, how much time has really gone by. When he starts writing these things, it becomes scripture in your Bible. Okay, so Paul, as his manner was in verse 2, went in unto them in three Sabbath days, so three weeks, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Out of the scriptures, that's another interesting term, or not term, but um, phrase that you really ought to take notice of. I would subscribe to you that that is probably Genesis to Second Chronicles, being the, the scriptures that, that Paul would have been using at that time. Okay, Old Testament, probably Genesis through 2 Chronicles. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. The Gospel of God. Same thing Peter preached. That man that you hung on the cross, he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The gospel of God. Okay, the gospel of Christ is founded upon the gospel of God. The foundation of all gospels, I think you, we've done this many times in the past, but if you will, the foundational gospel is the gospel of God. We put that at the base of the pyramid, if you will, because that's the foundation. When Paul talks about the foundation in like, 1 Corinthians, you know, I as a wise master builder have built upon the foundation of the apostles, the gospel of God. The gospel of Christ is built upon that. The gospel of Christ could not be true if the gospel of God was not true. Different gospels, the gospel of Christ. How, so, gospel of God, right there, that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Peter, in Acts chapter 2, that man you hung on the cross, he is the Christ the Son of the living God. The Gospel of Christ founded upon that. The Gospel of Christ, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and raised again for our justification. The Gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And then, of course, built upon that is the Gospel of... Gospel of the grace of God. This gospel of Christ during the Acts period. So we talked a minute ago about 
Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Those would be the six books that Paul wrote during the book of Acts. At that time, each one of those books, you'll see Paul say, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay? Paul is going to the Jew first. Acts 17, verse 2, Paul, as his manner was, went into the synagogue, right? So all during the book of Acts and 1 Corinthians is where we find the gospel of Christ, the gospel of your salvation, right? It's to the Jew first, also to the Greek. The gospel of the grace of God that comes into place after Acts 28, and now we no longer have to go to the Jew or to the synagogue to hear the gospel of Christ like they did back here at the beginning. Okay, Or once they, blas once they those in the synagogue, blasphemed, that released Paul from the promise to Abraham, I'll bless him that bless thee, curse him that curse thee, and then Paul could open up a church in a home nearby, in a building nearby, in a school of Tyrannus, and we'll come to next week or the week after. Okay? But Paul always went to the Jew first during the book of Acts when he wrote and, and showed us the gospel of Christ. But now it's the unbelieving Gentiles like those of us in this room. We did not, none of us in this room ever aligned ourselves with Israel. We didn't try to gain favor with God by going to the synagogues. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody with me? I'm, uh, let's see, can I say that a different way? Today, we just, it's, it's available to anybody and everybody who will simply hear the gospel preached, believe it in their heart, and trust in it, in it, the gospel of Christ. That and that alone for their salvation. But anybody can hear it. You don't have to go to a synagogue or align yourself with Israel to hear it today. That's the gospel of the grace of God. Okay? Uh, Acts 17, 3, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ, the gospel of God. Gospel of Christ, how that this Christ, who is the son of the living God, who lived a sinless life, that he could die on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures, take those sins to hell, leave them in hell, and be raised again for our justification. And then the gospel of the grace of God, that same gospel of Christ is now available to anyone out there that will hear it. You do not have to align with Israel. Okay? Brian, can I say that a better way? Uh, that, that kind of cover? Okay? Great. Thank you. All right, verse 4 of Acts 17. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. There's a lot of people here that believe, men and women. And we're seeing Greeks here coming into the picture, aren't we? But, just to emphasize, what type of Greek would this have been? Okay, They were aligning themselves with Israel. They were at the synagogue. They knew that they, to, for them to gain God's blessings, they had to be blessing Israel at that time. So that's why they were there. Okay, so when we see Greeks at this point, understand that's the type of Greek. Okay, verse 5. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy. Man, I would underline that word envy. It is amazing how often we're going to see envy motivating people to do things. I know you never see that today. Yeah. Okay. Moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren in unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. So let's stop for a minute. Okay, so in verse 5, the Jews become envious because, you know, 
what, what can we infer as to the source of their envy? You know, how about verse 4, the verse before it? And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few, a lot. Whoa, they saw all these numbers of people following the teachings of Paul. Wow. And they became envious. Instead of glorifying the message and glorifying the number of people that are believing, they become envious. Now, I know that never happens today. I know there's no groups today of mass numbers of people that have a good thing going and they see some people seeing truth, seeing doctrine, and glorifying about it. No, they get envious about it. Whoa, well, where are they going? And of course here, uh, these people may start following the doctrine that Paul, not may, they do start following the doctrine that Paul is teaching them. And so they leave the synagogue where they had been. All right? Everybody clear on that? You're seeing that in scriptures, right? You're going to see. Here's one of my favorite passages in the next two or three verses. Was that Paul and Silas that they were searching for? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So verse uh, 10, 11, and 12, this is one of the foundational principles of how you should study your Bible. Absolutely, positively, no matter what you ever think you see in Scripture, where you go, this is a principle by which you follow Scriptures and study your Bible. Verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews, as we saw earlier, Paul as his manner was, right? Now watch 11. These, context, who is these? The Bereans, absolutely. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Wow, stop reading for a second. Why in the world? You know, does it just say they're more noble? Well, no, we're going to, obviously, we're going to see it in the next phrase here. But watch this. Do you want to be noble today? Wouldn't you like to be called more noble than another? And, and remember, the Thessalonians were studying the Bible. Matter of fact, the Thessalonians, excuse me, they were studying the doctrine that Paul taught them. Okay. Matter of fact, Paul even writes two books back to Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Okay, Thessalonians were a great group of believers. But yet these Bereans are called more noble than them. And I don't see a, a book in your Bible called the Bereans. You know, I'm, I, you know, Paul may have, he may not have written a book back to them. It, it, the point is, it's not scripture. But why were they more noble? That's the point. So let's keep reading in verse 11, okay? These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Okay, Paul and Silas come to Berea. They teach, they proclaim the gospel. They teach doctrine to those in Berea. The Bereans hear it and they accept it with all readiness of mind. And what's the next phrase there? Or excuse me, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They searched the scriptures daily. That's the principle. Each one of you in this room, if you want to be more noble, search the scriptures daily. When you hear it taught, okay, I heard it taught. That seemed to make sense, but I'm going to go back and study it for myself in this Bible. Amen. Until you see it in this scripture, do not take it as, if you will, the gospel. You know, I, I assure you I'm not going to do something to intentionally mislead you. But I am in the flesh. I, mean, I, I showed you some scriptures last week in Ezekiel chapter 3. You know, if I, fail, if I warn you incorrectly, um, your blood's upon my shoulders as, as a man teaching the word in front of you. And I take that very seriously. When Brother Moore showed me that 25 years ago, it, I definitely said, whoa, I'm going to slow down and learn this Bible better. All right? We've got to take this seriously, as should all of you. But being students here, um, search the Scriptures daily, whether these things are so. Because, verse 12, Therefore, 
Why for? Because they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Notice when they believed. After they searched the scriptures to make sure those things that they had received with readiness of mind were so. Then they believed. Why? Because you see it in scripture, you know chapter and verse. So I, I, I encourage all families to have your own statement of faith. You know, we as a family believe, you know, A, how are you saved, All right? The gospel as laid out in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. We believe that the way a man is saved today, amen, a person is saved today is by hearing the gospel of Christ preached, believing that gospel, and trusting in that gospel and that gospel alone for our salvation. And that there is a moment in time. So we put verses by each of these statements. The Gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's where it's laid out. We believe that. We believe there's a moment of salvation. Romans chapter 6, 2 Corinthians, there's that day of salvation, that moment of salvation. There's a moment in time when we realize there never has been a moment in time where hearing the gospel preached. Matter of fact, we're going to take a quick break here. Let's come back to, you know, put a marker right there in Acts 17. Come back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Now this is going to be the death angel coming to those, to the children of Israel. You know, the tenth plague. Right? We all remember the, the story of the ten plagues that when Pharaoh finally let, you know, let my people go, Moses says, right? And that tenth plague comes. And then he lets the children go and they're going to uh, wander for 40 years in the desert after this. But we want to grab Exodus chapter 12 here talking about just prior to the death angel coming. All right, the death angel is going to come, and who does the death angel take? Uh, the firstborn. The firstborn male of every, not just people even, beast as well, beast of the field, every, every ram, every goat, every cow, the firstborn male of every, but primarily, let's put it to the, to the people here, okay? The firstborn male child of each family is going to be taken by the death angel. But there is a way to be saved from that. And God gives clear definition here. God the Father. So Exodus chapter 12 verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying. And on and on he goes. Now let me come down. Um, so verse 12. Exodus 12 verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, okay, tonight I'm coming, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses which ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt." Now come, a, come across over here to verse 21. So Moses and Aaron are given instructions to give to the people on how to save their firstborn male child. Verse 21, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Now I'm going to make an application of this to today. So Moses is a preacher today and he's going to proclaim the saving message to the people in front of him. Okay? Uh, verse 21, so he says, draw out in the middle there, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Okay, so he's very clear on how to do this. You're going to slit the throat of this lamb, you're going to catch it in a basin, the blood of the lamb. It takes the blood to cover sins. Okay, catch the blood. Then you're going to dip this hyssop branch in it. So let's keep reading. Verse 22, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. Okay? 
So you're going to dip a branch in there, this hyssop. You're going to put it on the lintel on the top of your door frame and on the two side posts of the door frame. Okay? They had to put the blood there. Okay? At the end of verse 22. Um, and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of this house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. That's the saving message right there for that time period. Don't go home and do that today. It's not going to make a difference. It's just going to make your neighbors look at you kind of funny. You know what? It would be scriptural to do that, though. But it wouldn't be dispensational to do that. It's in scriptures, it's in the Word of God, but it was for a different dispensation. To point the other way, it was for times past. Way times past, 1,500 years before Christ. Okay, but that was the, what they were told to do at that time. Okay, that's the key about dispensa studying the Bible with a dispensational point of view. God dealt with different... God dealt with man in different ways at different time periods. Okay, that's, that's the key difference. It's scriptural, but it's not dispensational. It's scriptural to build an ark so that you'll be saved. It's just not di dispensational to think that that would apply to today. It sure was in the dispensation in which Noah lived. That was his saving message. Okay, you see the difference between being scriptural versus being dispensational. The whole Bible is for us. Only parts of the Bible are to us today in the year 2013. It's Romans to Philemon. It's about 88 pages. That's what's to us today. Now, here's the thing. So the we know the story. The death angel comes that night. And of course, all the children of Israel went back to their homes. And the men that believed that were right there when... When Moses and Aaron gave that instruction, they heard with their ear the gospel of their salvation, if you will, preached to them. Go take a lamb, catch the blood in the basin, dip the hyssop branch in it, put it on the lintel and on the two side posts, your family will be saved. So they believed it, and they went on back. Now those that didn't believe it, didn't trust enough to take action, to do what they were told. I want to be careful about how I put works into this. Because works are no part of salvation today. But those that believed it still had to trust, you know, to go a step further. It's one thing to believe something, but when do you trust in it enough to, to take action, to do what you're supposed to do to... So, so their action was to, to then... They, they, had to, they did have a work to do, and boy... Okay, just keep going. So... They had a work to do, which was to kill the lamb, catch the blood, but it was the blood that saved them. Okay? They had to put the blood on the lintel and the two side posts. If they didn't do that, even though they believed that would save them, you know, if they believed it and they trusted it to do that action, death angel came that night, their firstborn male child lived. But what if they believed it, but did not take the action necessary, required, of that gospel. They didn't take the blood and put it on their door frame if you... Okay? The death angel came, didn't see the blood, death angel comes in and takes that firstborn male child. And that father could stand there all day long and say, wait a minute, I was there when Moses proclaimed the gospel. I heard him preach it, and I believed that if I did all that, you would not take my firstborn child. He'd be saved. Yeah, but did you do it? Did you do it? And, and so I'm making an application to the gospel of Christ. You hear the gospel preached. The gospel, how that Christ died for your sins and was buried and took those sins to hell and was raised again for your justification. You heard it preached. You probably heard it preached many, many times. I know most of you in this room have been here many, many times and have heard it preached many, many times. I will always, always, always preach the gospel every time I teach or preach. And if I haven't, I've just wasted 
you know, an hour of your time and my time too. Amen. All that matters is, is the gospel preached. All that matters is a person is either saved or they're not. At the end of our life, that's all that matters, whenever that is. Now, the gospel's been preached. You may believe it. But when did you, if you will, dip the branch in and apply the blood, not the lamb's blood in here, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? When he hung on that cross and shed his blood, he was paying the penalty right then and there on that cross for your sins, for you know, our sins is the gospel of Christ, for our sins according to the scriptures was buried, took those sins to hell, spent three days in hell paying the penalty we deserved. He took our place for us to justify us, and on the third day, God the Father raised him for our justification. You've heard that preached. You may believe that. Let me ask you, you think Satan believes on the, in the historical facts, the death, the burial, and the resurrection? Or you better believe it. He believes that probably about as, as 